It's our hope that today's conversation between UCSF Chancellor Dr. Sue Desmond Hellman and UCSF 2009 Nobel Laureate Elizabeth Blackburn will offer useful insights into the world you're entering. Dr. Desmond Hellman became Chancellor of UCSF on, on August 1. She came here from Genentech, one of the world's leading biotechnology companies. She was Director of Product Development of Genentech and is credited with bringing the first targeted cancer therapy, Herceptin, to market. Dr. Desmond Hellman trained as a medical doctor at the University of Nevada in her hometown of Reno. She came to UCSF for her medical internship and residency. Following nine years at UCSF, she and her husband, a fellow medical resident at UCSF, moved to Uganda on a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship to study heterosexual transmission of HIV. They then settled in Kentucky for two years where Dr. Desmond Hellman worked in private practice as a breast cancer oncologist before she, in her own words, followed her husband to Connecticut where he had been recruited to Bristol Myers Squibb, the biopharmaceutical company. Dr. Desmond Hellman worked at Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceutical Research Institute as Associate Director of Clinical Cancer Research. While there, she was the project team leader for Taxol, which is the anti-cancer chemotherapy drug. Next, equipped with a degree in epidemiology and biostatistics from UC Berkeley, a degree she earned while she was at UCSF, Dr. Desmond Hellman was recruited to Genentech. This time, Dr. Nicholas Hellman, who today is Executive Vice President for Medical and Scientific Affairs at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, followed his wife. The rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Elizabeth Blackburn was born in Tasmania, Australia, and is a naturalized citizen of the United States. She received both her undergraduate degree in biochemistry and her master's of science degree in biochemistry from University of Melbourne, Australia. She received a PhD degree in molecular biology from the University of Cambridge, England. After receiving a postdoctoral degree from Yale in 1977, she did a postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF. From 1978 to 1990, she was a professor of molecular biology at UC Berkeley. She joined UCSF in 1990 as a professor in the departments of biochemistry and biophysics and microbiology and immunology. In 1993, she was named the first, she was the first woman named to head the UCSF School of Medicine Department of Microbiology and Immunology, a position she held until 1999. Over the last 35 years, Dr. Blackburn has received 55 prestigious honors. One week ago, she was named to receive the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. She shares the award with Carol Greider, of John Hopkins University School of Medicine and Jack Shostak of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Desmond Hellman, Drs. Desmond Hellman and Blackburn have followed different career paths within the biomedical field. One as a physician, an executive pro in product development, and an institutional leader. The other as a basic scientist who has held leadership roles in international scientific societies, including her current position as president-elect of the American Association of Cancer Research. I also learned this morning both of them come from a family of seven kids and they're each number two. <laughs> <laughs> Much of what I suspect they will discuss today are the skills and human qualities and behaviors that have helped them succeed and find gratification in their work and satisfying relationships with their colleagues. These are characteristics that can be applied by the student who aspires to work quietly at the lab bench in his or her career or work in an inner city dental practice or as a clinical pharmacist or as a nurse or a physician or even as a leader of a major health sciences university and yes even as a Nobel laureate. Please join me today in welcoming Dr. Sue Desmond Hellman and the 2009 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. Good afternoon, everyone. What, what Barbara French didn't say, and I know Liz would uh, agree with me, is we're also here to have a little bit of fun. So I'm going to uh, play Oprah for about... 
<laughs> I promise not to make you cry. <laughs> not, not intentionally. <laughs> Isn't that what do Oprah's have, famous for? Do I have to renege my autobiography as well? You do. You do. <laughs> this just gets you ready for the book tour, Liz. So, so for about 20 to 25 minutes, I'm going to ask Liz some questions. And hopefully there are questions that you would all like to ask her as well. And then um, we'll be opening it up for, uh, for questions to the audience. And we're also uh, joined also by a webcast and can get questions that way. Um, but, but let me just start, Liz, by making sure that um, this is a, a very diverse audience. So maybe you could catch up everyone with, with the science, the reason that you won the Nobel Prize. Help us understand what a, a, a telomere or telomerase is. Yes. The, the prize was given for very basic fundamental research into, into how cells work. You know, cells are in all of our bodies, they make up our bodies, and we try and dig deep into them and try and understand what makes them tick. And what is very important in cells is the genetic information carried in chromosomes. And chromosomes, if you remember from pictures in textbooks, are linear. They have long linear DNA molecule running from end to end of the chromosome. And the linear chromosomal DNA ends are very, uh, are very uh, in, in jeopardy all the time. They're, they're susceptible to fraying away. It's a little bit like, I like this analogy, it's a little bit like a, you had a shoelace and the shoelace ends are susceptible to fraying away. And there are little things at the end of shoelaces, you notice like little plastic tips or little metal tips they're called aglets, and they protect the ends of the shoelaces. And so the telomeres are just like the protective tips at the end of your shoelace, where your shoelace would be the analogy for the uh, chromosome, which carries all the genes. So we have lots of chromosomes, we have lots of these uh, you know, linear chromosomes, all very important. Each and every one is very important for carrying genetic information. So they all have to be protected. And this protection at the ends of the chromosomes is called the telomeres, little telomere, one at each end. Now, telomeres wear down just in natural processes. They wear down over time as we, you know, replenish ourselves. They, they, they tend to wear down. Now, if they kept wearing down, you know, there'd be nothing left, right? <laughs> the shoelace would get shorter and shorter and fray away completely. It doesn't happen. And what we discovered was an enzyme uh, which we named telomerase, because it didn't exist in any dictionary and in any textbook, and telomerase, so telomere and then ase to sort of imply it as an enzyme. And what it does is it adds DNA back to the ends of the chromosomes. It replenishes the ends. It builds back those ends as they wear down and start to fray away. Telomerase builds them back up. So this was very basic research. How does, how does the um, cell chromosome protect its ends? How does it replenish its ends? Very molecular uh, research, and and what's been emerging in the you know last several years is is that this process of the chromosome ends wearing down and telomeres building them back up. That's really important for our continued good health. There has it has to be um, sufficient building back of telomeres, and if it doesn't happen properly, if they wear down too much, we're now understanding this makes people susceptible to some very very common diseases and how this works is a fascinating question because it now starts to ask questions about the whole body instead of asking about um, what's going on deep inside cells. So that's pretty much what it all, all was about. It was very much about basic, basic science. How do, how do cells work? How does, this, how does this work? We weren't actually uh, saying, well, we'd like to think about diseases of aging, but you never know in basic research. If you ask the right questions, you never know where um, you will find out interesting things that you never expected to find. But one of the things that I thought was the most fun in hearing you describe this research was how you got to use your curiosity. Yes. And yes, you just yes. asked, I wonder why yes. the ends of chromosomes. We're, we've got many students here, all the way from high school to yes. graduate students. Yes. When did you know as a student that, uh, that you were both curious and that you liked science? Was that true? Yes. In grammar school, high school, did you learn that later in life? Tell us about you as a student. Well, I I liked I liked animals actually. That's what I really liked, and um, we had lots of pets. At some stage, I I used to count up all the pets we had in our house. As as was mentioned, I, I came from a big family, and so we also seemed to sort of generate families of 
animals in our, in our place. So at one point I enumerated them. We had budgerigars, which are like parakeets, and canaries, and goldfish, and guinea pigs, and chickens, and those little chickens called pullets, and cats, and a dog. I think that was that was it. You know, so there was a lot of uh, <laughs> life going on, you know, of that kind. But I really also liked animals and nature as well. I, I just liked them. So that didn't really turn into science for a while, but then when I was in high school, I started reading about uh, people having ideas of how, you know, how the molecules of life worked. And, and I kind of got this idea, boy, if you knew about how the molecules of life worked, you would start to understand something about how biology works. And I was captivated by that, that, that idea. And so that really was, was, you know, I just read about it and, and really liked it. And I had good biology teachers but they weren't teaching molecular biology. I was reading books and seeing that there were really interesting things about science and how you ask questions and sort of this idea of molecules. So it was pretty much, you know, coming from liking animals and nature and then thinking, boy, this would be a really interesting thing to understand the molecules of nature that, that kind of sucked me in to uh, science. And then it just like one thing just kept following after another, went to college and you know, it just sort of seemed natural. But since I really liked doing science, I feel very fortunate because I knew I liked I liked science, and so I didn't have to agonize too much. Now I did play the piano through all through school, and I really loved the piano, and I was competent. But I also knew you had to be really, really good <laughs> if you were going to be a you know a performing pianist or something like that. So you know science take it that, you know, that was easy. Right? Science won over <laughs> piano playing. Well, no, I, I realized reality reality <laughs> was that I knew you know I could probably you know do something in science. Whereas to be a pianist, you have to be really fantastically good. I realized, <laughs> and you know I was okay, and but, but I realized. <laughs> so there was this thing. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You know, to be a musician would be a wonderful thing. But I also knew I didn't have what it took. So uh, the, the, that decision, you know, there was never a serious wrestle in my mind, just a kind of vague kind of, wouldn't that be lovely? No, nope, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so Liz, one of the things that I think is is interesting um, for if you're a student or, or if you're chancellor is how does yes. one ascend to win a Nobel Prize? And at least in my mind, and maybe some of yours, I have this sense of a linear progression where each year life got better for you and you just ascended <laughs> no. to the throne. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Since I guess that I'm wrong on that, maybe you could help us understand that path that I'm guessing might be a little more ups and downs. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the best days in the lab and maybe yes, some of the worst yes. days in yeah. the lab? No, no, it's a very, very perceptive question because when you, you, it's sort of like when people write scientific papers, they write it up as though we did this, 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 and this. Well, you know, lots of things went wrong. It wasn't the order. Eureka. And then you had Eureka, <laughs> and it was also logical. It didn't happen that way at all in most scientific papers, but in order to convey the sense of the story of the science, they're written that way. But, you know, it doesn't happen that way. So similarly, as, as you quite rightly said, uh, you know, there were definitely stages when, um, you know, I didn't get much in enthusiasm from, you know, my uh, sort of, you know, people in the social group I was in, you know, as I was growing up. Not my parents. They were fine. They they, they were fine with the idea that I would go into you know, study and so forth. But, um, you know, it wasn't really a, a very kind of cool thing to do, to want to do science. And so I, I, I learned some somewhat um, an ability, which I think was useful, which is to sort of just have a little kind of ability to not just hear those things. I think I was pretty good at hearing what I wanted to hear, <laughs> which is a great thing to do. I, I strongly recommend it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I'm really quite serious because if you if you start to get a sense of, you know, yeah, you, you do think you know what you are interested in and so forth, a lot of people will advise you. On the one hand, you want to listen, and then on the other hand, other hand, you want to really test it against, okay, is this really making sense? Or is it just that somebody I really respect said this, but I'm not sure that what they said makes sense? So so, so it wasn't that smooth. Um, so I went, as I said, you know, I went sort of on to graduate school, and that all seemed natural, and then to a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, and, and I, too, went to the place my husband was going to. I was originally actually going to come to UCSF. I had written the fellowship. 
and uh, and then you know love got in the way, right? And <laughs> and so uh, okay, this is where it gets like Oprah, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Except it didn't get in the way because I knew it was going to you know g going to Yale uh, as a postdoc was great too. That I was okay. To, and I went to a fantastic <laughs> lab, and and I was advised that the person who was my postdoc advisor, another kind of little. Take, take notice of this advice, that he was a really, really good mentor, and he was a very good scientist, no question. He still is a very good scientist and mentor. His name is Dr. Joe Gore. And he was not only a good scientist, but everyone said he's also a really, really good mentor. So here were the two things coming together. You know, my husband was going to go to Yale, um, I was going to want to go there, and he was this terrific lab I wanted to get into. But it wasn't so straightforward, because there was actually a snafu in the mail. So I uh, wrote to Joe Gall, and then some mail he sent didn't arrive back in England, and then I went off to Nepal. <laughs> Always good between stages and you create. Go somewhere exciting. Kind of clean your, clean your brain out. You know, That's we good went, advice. We That's went for good. a few weeks. You, know, you don't lose anything because you're between jobs. So anyway, I, so then I went to Yale because you know my then fiancé, soon-to-be husband, you know, had already gone there. And uh, and I walked into Joe Gall's lab and he was like really shocked. And he didn't quite say, you know, nobody invited you here. But <laughs> but it was sort of what he, in a, in a way, you know. And then we realized that there was mail issues that, you know, mail had not arrived and things. And then he got a letter from my advisor, Fred Sanger in Cambridge, my PhD advisor, who, you know, basically said, you know, she's she's okay, she won't steal the spoons. And, you know, so, <laughs> so. Was this an example of listening to what you want to listen to? <laughs> no, I honestly thought that I honestly thought that I had, uh, you know, said that I you had what, signed up. That, that I had sort of signed up, and and there had been some miscommunication, which we tortuously sort of later realized what probably had gone on. But partly, you know, it was that, well, I was coming anyway. And uh, so, so that was an interesting thing, but it wasn't like a setback, but it was a kind of moment uh, when... <laughs> and so what else? I mean, other things, you know, when you're a postdoc, you, you're very challenged because you're doing research and you're now trying to be very independent and things are difficult and then you have to go and find a job. And, and I tell you, that was the most discouraging time for me personally, this... this um, time when I felt, you know, I had to go out there and sort of show my mettle against all these other terrific people who were competing for jobs. And, and it was a very, very much uncertain period for me. And certain people helped, helped me and, you know, helped me with my seminar, which was really amazingly wonderful that they did. And, uh, but at one point I actually thought, you know, we were married then a few years and, uh, you know, life was going on. And, and at one point I thought I was pregnant and I thought, my goodness, I won't have to hunt for jobs anymore. You know, I was so ready to be, no, I'm serious. I was so sort of uncertain of myself. It was so daunting so ready, to get a job. And it was so daunting in my mind that, and then it wasn't the case. And so, you know, and, and then I realized that, you know, that hadn't been something that I, I don't think I really would have stopped doing science. I hope not. <laughs> but, but I don't, you know, but I really very much was very much, uh, you know, feeling very sort of daunted and overcome by the challenges of finding jobs. I mean, I, for some reason, I kept all my rejection letters from all the universities, you know, because I'm very systematic and I think I'm systematic sometimes, but I keep a lot of stuff. <laughs> if you're not systematic, you keep the stuff so eventually you can find it. So you can become systematic. So you go. can become systematic. So I have lots of rejection letters. Somebody not long ago wanted to see them. And I looked at them all and man, you know, you, you get all these things. So one after the other arriving. You, know, you have to kind of be tough. Yeah. Can <laughs> so, you talk um, a little more about the mentorship part? So, so yes. you said that Dr. Gore was yes. known as a good mentor, and yes. you're known as a good mentor. Uh, many of the, the students and, and myself have probably experienced both the positive and yes. negative aspects yes. of a good yes. boss or a good mentor. Right. What right. are the things that you looked for, yes. and what are the things that, that you aspire to do yourself to be a yes. good mentor? Yes. You know, it's amazing how much we learn from people because I learned mentorship things from my two um, advisors. In fact, even the advisor back when I was a master's student in, in Australia. Um, who, who's, and I'll, do, I'll talk about him for a moment because he was somebody who would be, he was interested in what the aspirations of the students in his lab were. And he would I actually asked us, could really try and think about what it was that we wanted. And he would try to get us to articulate what we wanted. So so that was a great example of somebody who really showed an interest in, well, what were the aspirations of the people in, in his lab? You know, they weren't just um, people who do, were doing the work 
to get his research project done. He was he was genuinely interested. And then when I went to Cambridge, I went to the MRC lab, uh, which is um, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which is uh, you know degrees from Cambridge University you get from there. And uh, my advisor Fred Sanger was actually inventing DNA sequencing then. You know most of you, I think, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, DNA sequencing has existed since you were born, I think. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there was a time when nobody knew how to do it. And for, so Fred was, was figuring out how to do it. And so he was very much in the lab, and that was a, an example for me to see how someone like Fred, who actually already had a Nobel Prize for sequencing insulin. And so here he was, and he'd get another Nobel Prize for learning how, teaching people how to, uh, teaching as in inventing, how to sequence DNA. So he shared a Nobel Prize in that. But the point was, here he was working in the lab day after day himself. That's what he liked to do. So it was a great example of somebody with their feet on the ground. They really like the science. So that was a very good thing to see going on. And he kind of had the feeling that if you were in his group, then you know you would sort of know how to figure things out a bit. And so he somewhat left you alone, which which I liked personally. Uh, I, I temperamentally kind of liked that. So that was one advising uh, style again. And then I went to Joe Gold's lab. And, and Joe, again, had, a, you know, it wasn't a conscious mentoring style. It was the way he was a scientist and the way he was a, a person, I think. You know, and I think he would have curled his toes up in horror, you know, and said, oh, my gosh, mentoring, you know. No, no, it sounded very sort of contrived if you said it in those days. And what he did was he just really respected the people in, in his lab, and he let them know. And at one point, when I was applying to just, you know, every institution, if it moved, I applied to it. You know, I was so unsure <laughs> of myself. How many, how many institutions I don't know, did you apply but, to but for lots of letters. How many rejection letters yes, do you have? Yes, yes. And so it turns out the more you apply to, the more rejection it get, right? So this, was, this is not a good idea. And so, so, so but at one point, I, I, and so I, I had I'd applied to some place, and it was a very, um, you know, it wasn't a large place or anything like that. And, and, and he sort of took me into his office. He said, look, he said, you know, you, you're a first-class scientist. You, you, you should withdraw your application from this place. Now, that's a very good thing, you know, to s hear from your advisor. And, and I realized that advisors need to say that to the people in their labs, you know, because we're very critical as scientists. We're trained to pick holes in things, find the faults. And we're not trained to do these sort of affirmative things because it's not really in our job description as scientists. And, and yet he got that it was important for somebody to function as a scientist. They needed also to sort of function with some, some degree of um, confidence. So these were really, really, you know, different but very important influences on me. So I just try to copy what they did in various settings is the bottom line, because I felt I had really good kinds of mentored experiences so they were good role models for in you. different ways yes and joe himself was very engaged in the science now he was in a big university and so he had more administrative things to do but he still really really liked the science and whenever he could he was engaged in the lab with it and so that sort of you know being there for the people in his lab and so forth uh thing it was again something i picked up as something i liked about his style so i try to do it you know we all try and we never do as well as we can or as, as we hope that uh, Carol Greider at UC yes, Berkeley. Carol and was my graduate student. She was your yes, grad can yes, you talk a little yes. bit about how you and Carol worked yes. together since she was your graduate yes. student? Yes. So so every graduate student is an individual and everybody has a different sort of way of doing science, approaching science, where they are and so forth. And um, and so Carol was it was exactly right for, for sort of the time. So what had happened was that all these lines of evidence, and I think there were sort of three or four lines of science evidence, I won't go into it, but had suggested there maybe would be some new enzymatic activity that added DNA to the ends of chromosomes in ways that hadn't been seen before. So that's where data were converging. And so, so, so I thought, well, you know, if there's really an enzyme, we should go and hunt for it, but you don't just sort of throw this project to the poor student and say, hey, go find an enzyme that, you know, no one thinks exists, <laughs> you know. And so I thought, well, I'll do a few experiments myself. So I did a few experiments myself and got some hints, you know, putting in DNA, seeing if they changed in ways that argued that they might be telomeric DNA, which was the DNA that we uh, had reasoned might be there. So I was doing, did a few experiments and there was some really, you know, good sort of like, ah, I think something's going on here. 
And then it was a matter of, okay, I'm a you know, professor at Berkeley, I've got my teaching, I've done all this stuff, so you have to have someone who will really do this properly. And so I sort of suggested that to at least one person in the lab who sort of said, yeah, yeah, Liz, you know, they're <laughs> nice, <laughs> you know, but didn't want to do it. And, and But Carol was just, she had exactly the right temperament. She said, yes, I think that's really interesting. She wanted to, to dive into this project. And um, when you have a risky project, you sometimes have other things going on too, kind of the safe thing, you know, just in case this never works out. Backup strategy? Yeah, and she, she was doing some yeast-related thing, which was not, it was sort of from a previous collaboration, because she's very smart and she could handle lots of things at once. But as I said, look, if you really, at some point I said, you know, I think you really have to just focus on this one. And brave soul, she said yes, you know, and just did, and didn't, you know, do any other backup stuff. And so then it was great because she was very smart and very, um, she had no inertial barriers. She just would do things. So it was just wonderful because we'd talk back and forth. And sometimes I swear we'd have the same idea the same night sometimes. And we'd go and say, I'd say, ah, yes, such and such. And she'd say, yes, such and such. You know, oh, yeah. But, you know. So it was great fun because she was very bright and she was doing this thing. Other people in the lab were doing sensible things. And she was doing this thing that I loved. And so, you know, we talked back and forth. And um, nobody else in the lab was doing it at that stage. So, so, and, and then, you know, it really progressed very, very well. But, you know, it was because she had the right sort of brave temperament to say, you know, I, this is interesting. I'm going to go for it. So um, I don't know about all of you, but as I sit here, I wish I was Liz's graduate student. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, somebody Are you who says, <laughs> somebody who says, well, well, no, it's a scary thing being a graduate student because you know you don't know how things are going to work out, and so it is very reasonable to have safer projects and things like that. But you know, there's certain decisions that you just have to make and say, well, I'm just going to try certain things, Perfect. and you know, safe projects. I mean, they're tempting, but in the end, I think they're short-sighted, because in the end, you know, if you know they're going to work, then then uh, the the trick is, I suppose, if they don't work, is to know what you can get out of them, and and I think that's that's something we all kind of learn in, in biology, and I'm sure you know. <laughs> you know, you take what I've works. learned many lessons. Yes, <laughs> and <yeah>. take what <laughs> works. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to ask was another question, but after I uh, ask one more question, I'm going to open it up for questions. So, start thinking of what you all want to ask. Um, one of the more interesting collaborations that you've had recently is to start to look about the role of telomeres or telomerase in stress. Yes, yes. I actually have two questions. One is, can you tell us what you learned in that research about stress? Yes, yes. And second, speaking of stress, yes. you mentioned Nepal and taking breaks. It, yes. It's hard work doing science. So both either informed by your own scientific uh, work or, or just your own success, can you give some advice to all of us about yes. both what you've learned about stress and yes. how you personally manage stress? Yes, yes. Should I do the personally managed one because it's what very easy? Because I, I really <laughs> think I think you should. You know, it's such a cliche, but work hard, play hard. You know, it really, really I think is important. And so, you know, there's this idea that you sometimes hear about. Oh well, everything should be balanced, and that sounds very, very dull. I think if you really <laughs> like something, <laughs> and I understand family and and career balances, and and I don't think that's dull. I'm actually serious. I think it can be over many years that the balance can be achieved, but not every single day necessarily. I think things come, you know, and you do them very intensely. So I think having intense relaxation is, is really important. You know, be it going away for a few weeks or be it, you know, some something or other where your mind can do something different. And, and that's worked, you know, in my personal case, the sort of going into a different space uh, whether it's geographical or something like that, or you know something like that, where you just turn your mind off. I think you, we have to do that to stay to really creative. take a break. You really take a break, yes, but really be cre to keep our creative sort of energies going. So the the stress that um, that that you're alluding to uh, is is the kind of stress that we have to define because we all know stress, and we you know stress can be good. There's no question there's good stress. There's also a very insidious, clinically very bad stress, which is chronic psychological stress. And what that means is when the person doesn't have the ability to cope with the situation, it's unpredictable, they feel overwhelmed. There's a whole list of things. And it can be in a lot of life situations, and it can last for many years. 
And it's not the same, though, as the sort of stress that comes from challenges. And a lot of us in this room, I think, do challenge stress. So we may whine, but it's good for us. So, <laughs> so, so we just have to distinguish the person who's in a situation that's really, really out of their control for many years. And there's a lot of situations you could probably all imagine them. But one example studied in the study that my collaborator, Alyssa Apple, uh, was doing in which we collaborated was uh, people who are the primary caregiver, they happen to be women, of somebody who's chronically ill. One study was the mother of a chronically ill child, her child, autism, gut disorders. The child is, you know, she's the primary caregiver and she doesn't know what's happening, uh, you know, from day to day in terms of she can't predict. It's very, very hard on, on such people. And so th it's called, a, you know, a long term stressor. And similarly, people who are the primary caregiver for, say, a family member who has. Um, dementia of one kind or another. It's becoming quite common. That's another well-recognized one that takes a physical toll. So about nine years ago, Lisa Epoch uh, emailed me and uh, I didn't know who she was. And she, said, and she said, I would really like to know what happens to telomeres and chronic stress. And I just thought, how interesting, you know, and what an interesting study. And I said, you know, nobody knows, but, you know, why don't look, you know, you know. And so that's how it began. So she carefully built up her study group over the years and then, um, and then you know, then when it was time to measure the telomeres telomerase part of it, and then suddenly things just started coming together. So we had no idea. We just thought it would be completely random. What the chronic stress was doing was, and it now seems pretty clear we can say this, is making the telomeres wear down worse and maintain themselves worse. I think we can say that. You know, as scientists, you have to be careful, but it's really looking like that. Long years of uh, research have shown that that kind of chronic stress has impact on even lifespan in certain studies and uh, cardiovascular disease, onset of you know diabetes, a lot of common things. It impacts in ways that we sort of found this very concrete thing. Oh, the telomere maintenance is getting worse. And so it, it's an old story, the clinical result. You must be very familiar as a clinician with it. But this gave a sort of... Um, but there's some biology it gave it. it gave something yeah. more concrete. This, and there's a lot of very sophisticated biology of stress hormones and all the physiological responses that the body has. There's tremendously sophisticated um, knowledge of physiology of what happens in stressed individuals. Very much research has gone into it. But this added this sort of concrete thing that kind of fitted with the idea of it making people age faster. And so that was... Um, Does the good thing. stress not... In well, fact, well if we say exercise is good stress, well, certainly there's been nice twin studies where the twin with longer tel with who exercises for leisure, you know, not carrying you know bricks up a hill or something, but leisure exercise, <laughs> fun, uh, exercise. fun ex it's exercise they chose. Yeah, that they have longer telomeres than the twin, so it was a very nice British study. So there is yes. good stress and bad. Stress. Yes, and that's what I wanted to emphasize because it sounds like you, you know if you just say oh stress is bad, then it sort of sounds like oh you don't want to do anything. So I'd really want to distinguish. <laughs> no, I want, I want to distinguish that 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 it's that the bad kind is really clearly well defined, and it is the kind where people are in situations that they're pretty helpless. In, and they feel and they feel hopeless about it. But it's fascinating because it's real physiology that is going on with the mind, really affecting physiology, which is not news. That's old news in medicine. But but maybe perhaps explained yes. in part by the chromosomes. That's, that's the, the that's the thing. very yeah. interesting thing that's looking like huh, this might actually be the case. Yes. I think we'll let that so. be the last word. That's very inspiring. So Join me in thanking Liz for being so generous with her time and her thoughts that are so inspiring for all of us. And much congratulations on the Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs>